Thank you very much. Um, so I'll let you know right away that I will not ever say yes or no to, to the answer of this question. Uh, so the suspense is, is gone. But uh, <clears throat> so a question that I think a lot of people <clears throat> in this workshop are interested in is, can we derive the standard model or something close to the standard model from some reasonable principles? And so, of course, the internal degrees of freedom in the standard model, the hypercharge, isospin, and color are described by algebras of observables that are connected to representations of this standard model gauge group, which I like to call S of U2 times U3. So remember, that's the five by five unitary matrices with determinant one that are in this block form of a two by two block and a three by three block. Uh, so the big question, one big question then becomes why in the world should this particular group be favored and the particular representations uh, that we see. <clears throat> so there has been quite a bit of work on this kind of thing and in particular, for example, Alan Cohn and his collaborators have tried to answer it using non-commutative geometry. They've actually given a number of different uh, answers, different, different papers attempting to do this, where <clears throat> they think of space-time as having the uh, usual uh, manifold description in the uh, horizontal directions, you might call them, but then a non-commutative description in terms of a finite dimensional non-commutative algebra in terms in the uh, vertical or fiber or internal directions. Um, so I'm going to present something much more tentative than their work. <clears throat> Certainly not a theory of physics. It's really a review of some work by Todorov and Dubois-Violet and a bit of uh, Kirill Krasnov's work. Um, and these involve Oct Octonians and Jordan algebras. So I like Jordan algebras because they're a very conceptually clear framework <clears throat> for dealing with observables in, a, in quantum physics. And I'll explain them. I think they're often thought of as being a little bit weird, but I'd like to try to explain them in a way that makes them seem very natural. In the classification of Jordan algebras of a certain kind, one discovers the exceptional Jordan algebra consisting of three by three self-adjoint octonionic matrices. This is sort of different than all the other ones. Uh, you could think of it in modern language, in fashionable language, as the algebra of observables of an octonionic Q trit. So uh, there's been a lot of talk these days about whether physics could somehow be explained in terms of quantum information theory. I guess this goes back all the way to uh, uh, John Wheeler's idea of it from bit, but more recently with the interest in quantum computation, people are trying to come up with ideas for how to get physics to arise naturally out of out of qubits. But you could also have Q trits where the Hilbert space is not C2, but C3. And you could also replace the complex numbers by other number systems. And so that gives you the idea of an octonionic Q trit in a rough, in a rough form. Um, and so I'm going to explain some ideas of Michel Dubois, Violet, and Ivan Todorov and we'll see the following purely mathematical result that the true gauge group of the standard model, this group S of U2 times U3, consists of the symmetries of an octonionic Q trit that have two special properties. First, they preserve all the structure that arises from a choice of a unit imaginary octonion, which I'll call I in the octonions. So that picks out a copy of the complex numbers in the octonians. And second of all, they restrict to give symmetries of an octonionic qubit, which you can think of as sort of sitting inside the octonionic Q trit. So I don't know really what this means. Uh, I've, I've been thinking about this, trying to understand uh, what it means, but it's appealing to me because we're getting the gauge group of the standard model from some ideas that 
that have some resonance with uh, ideas from the foundations of quantum physics. And I'll, so I'll explain this. So let's just start at the beginning here though, and think about observables in quantum mechanics. Um, so in the most common approach to finite dimensional quantum systems, you take observables to be self-adjoint complex matrices so elements of what I'll call HNC and by n permission complex matrices. And what can you do with those things mathematically? Well, you can take real linear combinations of them. The big thing you can't do with them is multiply them in the usual way because the product of self-adjoint matrices isn't self-adjoint. However, what you can do is you can square a self-adjoint matrix and get a self-adjoint matrix. And this has a very nice physical meaning. So it means that when, if you take two different uh, non-commuting observables, there's no reason to expect there to be any well-defined observable that's the product of those two. For example, position times the momentum in, a, in another situation is, is not an observable in quantum mechanics. But you can always square an observable and get an observable. However, once you know that you can square observables and also take real linear combinations of them, then you can define a kind of funny product of observables called the Jordan product, which is just one half of a plus b squared minus a squared minus b squared. And in the particular, and in this, uh, if you work out what that is in the case of these n by n permission matrices, it's just one, of, one half of a b plus b a. So it's a kind of symmetrized product. Um, so this product has peculiar properties compared to other forms of algebra. So it's commutative, obviously, but it's not associative. Uh, but it is, however, power associative, meaning that if you take a product of a bunch of copies of the same observable, you can parenthesize it in any manner and you always get the same answer. Um, that power associativity has a good physical significance. It means that not only can you square an observable and get a well-defined observable, you could also cube it or raise it to the fourth power and get an unambiguously defined observable. And so that's something that I think uh, we can say is a, a, a reasonable thing you might want uh, just from conceptual reasons. Uh, if you're in a world where measuring one observable may mess up the measurement of another, then you have to be very careful about, about multiplying them. But, but raising a single one to a power, you, you could measure that just by measuring your original observable and then raising the answer, uh, the experimental answer to that power. So that's a, a nice thing to have. And so Jordan and Wigner and von Neumann turned these ideas into a definition of a mathematical structure. Now the good Jordan algebras are the ones called the Euclidean Jordan algebras or sometimes formally real Jordan algebras. There are other Jordan algebras, but as far as I'm concerned, they're sort of a mess compared to these in terms of uh, understanding what they're, what's really going on with them. Um, so because the definition here of an Euclidean Jordan algebra is pretty nice and conceptual. So it's a real vector space with a bilinear commutative and power associative product that has one additional property, which is to, which says that if the sum of the squares of a bunch of elements is zero, then every one of them has to be zero. And all of these properties here are more or less justifiable. You can make a good argument for them fr starting from our concept of observable in quantum physics. In particular, the last property is a way of saying that the observable should be thought of as real valued things that you measure and get a real number as your answer. And so if you measure a bunch of quantities uh, that are squares and they add up to zero, well, if they're real valued quantities, then they all have to be real. So this is a beautiful definition. There's a general definition of Jordan algebra, which involves some bizarre looking identity, which I don't want to even write down. That bizarre looking identity, which I'm not going to even talk about, it follows from this stuff. So in the special case of a Euclidean Jordan algebra, we don't even need to talk about that identity until we want to start getting technical. 
I'm mentioning that just because you may have seen the, the general definition of a Jordan algebra and wondered what happened to that funny looking identity in my treatment. So starting from this, Jordan von Neumann and Wigner proved that a classification of finite dimensional Euclidean Jordan algebras, and they showed that they're all isomorphic to a direct sum of ones like this. There's a little list of them. So you can take the n by n self-adjoint real matrices uh, with the Jordan product of the form that I already wrote down. Uh, you can do it for the complex matrices, which is the motivating example. You can do it for the quaternionic matrices and you can do it for the octonionic matrices. However, only n by n self-adjoint octonionic matrices where n is less than or equal to three actually give you Jordan algebras. And so the case n equals three is the most unusual one. That's the exceptional Jordan algebra. And I believe that was discovered in this classification theorem. Although the mathematician Adrian Albert started thinking about that algebra at about the same time. And sometimes it's called the Albert algebra. I hear from some people that, that, that these three gentlemen here discovered the exceptional Jordan algebra. I'd like to know the answer to that, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, finally, there's another infinite family of Euclidean Jordan algebras, which are called spin factors sometimes. So these are of the form R direct sum Rn, where the first copy of R contains the multiplicative uh, unit. The, well, there's an identity element in this Jordan algebra. Um, but you, anyway, the formula for the multiplication is as, as shown below here. So I'm suggestively writing the elements as T and X arrow to make you think of space time. And the multiplication works, works like this, that the, if you take the dot product of two of the uh, uh, spatial elements, it, it, you, you get a number and that, that, that goes into the time part. And then this is a, the vector times the scalar here. And this is just the product of two scalars. So it's basically built up out of the operations that you can do when you have a vector space with a dot product. So that's also a somewhat mysterious uh, class of Jordan algebras compared to these ones which look like the matrix algebras that we're familiar with in the study of finite dimensional quantum systems. So what about these spin factors? What's, what's going on with these spin factors? Well, I'll tell you a few results about Jordan algebras without attempting to, to prove them. So one nice fact, well, this is, this is fairly obvious here. There's other results that'll be a little less obvious. The, every Euclidean Jordan algebra, let's call it J, it automatically comes with a cone of what we could call non-negative elements, which are the sums of squares. So I've already sort of shown from the definition, if you think about it a bit, that this is a cone, meaning that if you add two elements of J plus, you get another element of J plus. And if you multiply an element of J plus by a positive number, you get an element of J plus. Uh, so in the matrix examples, these would be the, um, the non-negative Hermitian matrices, the ones with non-negative eigenvalues, say in the complex case. But for the spin factor, this cone is isomorphic to the future cone in n plus one dimensional Minkowski space-time. So there's some funny similarity between the spin factors and space-times. Also, so this is a, isomorphic sorry. as what? Um, so there's a concept of a vector space with a cone and a map, linear map between vector spaces mapping one cone to another cone. Oh, so just isomorphic like, as cones in, in vector spaces. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so, so every, every Euclidean Jordan algebra comes with a cone. Usually, most of these cones are not isomorphic to cone, the cones you're familiar with from Minkowski space time. Uh, but, but for the spin factors, they are exactly those. Yes, John. If I yeah. wanted to get the, the backward pointing ones, would that be very hard? No, you would just take the negative of the elements of J plus. Okay. So that, yeah, you should imagine that is also being there. So just, just the take 
take minus all the elements in J plus and you get this other cone that we could call J minus if you wanted. So yeah, they're both, they're all there. Um, then another fact that's a little less obvious is that, well, quite a bit less obvious is that every Euclidean Jordan algebra automatically gets a function on it. That is, you can just cook it up without making any arbitrary choices, which we call the determinant uh, that takes values in the real numbers, which vanishes on the boundary of J plus. In the case of these uh, Jordan algebras that are matrices like self-adjoint real or complex or matrices, the determinant is just the usual determinant of a matrix. And so that's why we call it determinant. Uh, but for the spin factor, <clears throat> this determinant function is the Minkowski metric. That is, it's t squared minus <clears throat> x dot x. So this is another way in which the spin factors uh, sort of look like Minkowski space times. Well, they, they look exactly like Minkowski space times. Um, so there's something funny going on here, which I've pondered for a long time. <clears throat> so a lot of you out there, <clears throat> which is that spin factors aren't only algebras of observables. It's a little bit tendentious to say this, but I'll say it anyway. There are also Minkowski space times. Now, the Jordan algebras of two by two self-adjoint matrices are especially interesting uh, because those turn out to be isomorphic to spin factors. So in this classification of Jordan algebras that I wrote down, there's a bit of overlap or redundancy that these four cases here, two by two self-adjoint matrices valued in, a, in R, C, H, or O, th those are isomorphic to Minkowski. They're, those are isomorphic to the spin factors shown here, which you can imagine as uh, being incarnations of three, four, six, and 10 dimensional Minkowski space time. This coincidence has launched a thousand ships. It's very important, for example, in why supersymmetric theories have work very beautifully in these particular dimensions. Um, but I'm not going to go in that direction here. I just want to point out the basic idea, which is that if you take the determinant of a two I two matrix, that will be the determinant function that I've been talking about in, in these four cases here. And the determinant of a two by two matrix really just is a Minkowski metric, if you, which becomes clear if you write down the matrix entries in this kind of way. So the diagonal entries of a Hermitian matrix are real. So T and X here are real. And the off diagonal entry here is just any old entry in our division algebra, R, C, H, or O. But that, that's a normed algebra. And so uh, that element times its, and it has a kind of star operation. And so that element times its star is the norm squared. Um, so so that, that's, that's sort of, that's, that's hinting at why we have this, uh, these isomorphisms. That's not the proof of the isomorphism of Jordan algebras, but that's the basic uh, clue there as to what's going on. Whereas when we get to three by three matrices, the determinant is a cubic function and so on. So we'd get light cones described by cubic equations in, in, that, in that case and so on. Um, so, so what's going on here though? This is all sort of rather mysterious <clears throat> because we started out trying to uh, formalize the concept of an algebra of observables using some very elegant clean axioms. And then these three geniuses figured out how to classify them all but then all of a sudden we've gotten hurled into the world of, of these Minkowski space times, which wasn't what we were trying to talk about at all. So something strange is going on here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is my best attempt to understand that so far. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one thing is that a Euclidean Jordan algebra doesn't just describe observables, it also describes states. So, turns out that any Euclidean Jordan algebra automatically comes with another function besides the determinant, it comes with a trace. So there's another real valued function on your Jordan algebra. That's a linear functional actually. Um, and, and for the case of matrices, the case of Euclidean Jordan algebras of matrices, it's just the usual trace. 
Um, and an element in this positive cone or non-negative cone with trace equals one is a state. So that should remind you of a density matrix in quantum mechanics. And indeed, a density matrix would be a special case of this idea. So we're just generalizing that. And so in particular, given a state S and an observable A, we can define the expected value of the observable A in the state S. And we define it to be the trace of S times A, where we use the Jordan product. Um, so this is, again, supposed to be familiar. If you've studied enough quantum mechanics, this is just the way that you take a so-called density matrix and an observable and calculate the expected value of the observable in that using that density matrix. Um, and finally, there are certain special elements in a Jordan algebra that are called projections, who are just elements whose squares themselves. And if you have a projection whose trace is equal to one, that turns out to be a special kind of state. Uh, you can check that it's going to be a non-negative element because it's the square of something, namely itself, and its trace is one, so it's a state, but these are some special states and these are called the pure states. So all this stuff is very familiar in the case of the n by n complex matrices where the states are the density matrices and any vector, unit vector in a Hilbert space gives you a projection onto that vector, which gives you a pure state. So the whole formalism of, uh, of quantum mechanics not just the observables, but also the states and pure states uh, can be done starting with the Euclidean Jordan algebra. So that, that's why it's a nice formalism for doing physics. Now, if you work out what the space of pure states is, for the matrix algebra cases, it's more or less familiar. Where we are, I hope, uh, used to the idea that the space of pure states for a complex quantum system is complex projective space. So you take C to the N, you take the unit vectors, and then you identify two unit vectors if they differ just by a phase. And so you get CPN minus one as the space of pure states. But you can also think of that as the space of uh, projections, projection operators in here. Uh, so, so uh, sorry, with trace one, projections onto, onto one dimensional subspaces. So that works the same way in all these three cases. And it also works even in the octonionic case, although that's the, the tricky case. Um, but you can ask, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but what is the space of pure states for one of our spin factors? The, the goal here is to try to like understand the, the spin factors. Well, there it turns out, you can just work it out that the space of pure states is a sphere. It's S n minus one. We can actually draw this whole story very accurately uh, in the case of the spin factor uh, where n equals two, because then the spin factor is just a three-dimensional space and we can actually draw what's going on. And so the so it looks like this. The, the forwards cone is just the usual, uh, just the usual, a usual cone in three dimensions. The surface where the trace is equal to one is a, is a horizontal plane. And so if we intersect those two, we get a, this gray disk here, and those will be the states uh, of our Jordan algebra. And then the pure states turn out to be the ones on the boundary. In fact, that's always true that the pure states uh, form the boundary of the space. Well, they form the extreme points, sorry, not the whole boundary, but just the so-called extreme points of the set of states. But here it's here it's the whole boundary. It's the it's this it's this one sphere in this case, a circle. The the surface with a determinant equals zero is what you'd call the light cone, both the forwards and the backwards light cone. Um, so, so we're seeing that the uh, concepts which have one meaning in terms of space-time geometry, like forwards light cone, uh, uh, future, um, sorry, interior of the light cone and so on. All those geometrical concepts familiar from Minkowski space-time have uh, analogs where we think of them in terms of uh,
quantum systems. I mean, they have other descriptions is what I mean, where we think of them as quantum concepts. Now, what's nice about all this is that we have one way of thinking about states in these uh, matrix cases and a different way of thinking about states in the spin factor cases. But I said that in certain examples, the spin factors are also uh, algebras of matrices. And so then we get a, a, a nice matchup of the two ways of thinking of things, namely uh, what in the two by two matrix cases, the space of states on the one hand, it's a projective line, RP1, CP1, HP1, or OP1. But on the other hand, because the set of pure states and the spin factor is a sphere, you also get a sphere. So you get a one sphere, a two sphere, a four sphere, and an eight sphere. Um, a lot of you, or a lot of people who study math or, or physics are well familiar with the fact that the, the Riemann sphere, CP1, is also a, a two sphere, but the, it has these analogs in the these four cases. Um, and so, of course, these are also the, uh, the Jordan algebras that we would say are the observables for a, a qubit. I mean, we're most familiar with complex qubits, uh, and then CP1 is the space of states of a, of a complex qubit, but we can talk about real complex quaternionic or octonionic qubits. And those qubits, those pairs of well, if we think of it in terms of a Hilbert space approach, they'd be pairs of real numbers, pairs of complex numbers, pairs of quaternions, pairs of octonions. Those also turn out to be the spinners, the left-handed or right-handed spinners in the space times of these various dimensions. So there's something nice going on in these cases. Now, there's something that I've left out, which is sort of necessary if you really want to do physics at least the way that we're accustomed to doing it. In ordinary physics, we have Noether's theorems saying that observables should generate symmetries. Um, and it turns out that, that wanting that to be true, complex case as special, because only the only Euclidean Jordan algebras, uh, of all the Euclidean Jordan algebras on my list, only the n by n complex permission matrices can also be made into a Lie algebra. So you, you want to make, you want your observables to generate symmetries, so they should form the Lie algebra of some Lie group. And only in this case can you do that if you want the Lie algebra to act in a non-trivial way, not zero way, uh, as derivations of the Jordan product. So in the case of the complex matrices, you can define a new Lie bracket which I'm going to write as, as a Poisson bracket here, but it's, it's a Lie bracket and it's I times the commutator. So right, the commutator of self-adjoint matrices is not self-adjoint, but when you multiply it by I, it becomes self-adjoint. So then you get this Lie bracket structure on your observables and it has this nice property, which says that if you, uh, which says that bracketing with A acts like a, like a derivative, it obeys a kind of product rule. Um, so, so that's what we use all the time in quantum mechanics, where we let uh, observables generate symmetries. And if you look at Schrodinger's equation, or sorry, the Heisenberg formulation of quantum mechanics, that, that I shows up there, as well as the commutator. So it turns out that you cannot do anything, you cannot get this uh, mathematics to, to work in any way uh, for the cases of the real or the quaternionic matrix uh, cases. Uh, and I wrote a paper about this and, and some reflections on that. But one interesting thing is that those real and quaternionic cases actually do still play a role in ordinary quantum mechanics, but they have to be sort of in, uh, fit inside the complex picture to actually, to actually work. So there are, there are some group representations that are said to be real, even though they're complex representations, they, they come from a real representation. And there's some that are called quaternionic, which come from a quaternionic representation. And those kinds of representations play a special role in quantum mechanics. So I, I argue in this other paper here that, that all three division algebras actually are visible in ordinary quantum mechanics. But with, with HNC playing, kind of starring role, 
uh, because I believe of this fact that only in that context can you get observables to generate symmetries. So question, John. Sure. Um, so it seems like in all examples, in addition, like you're talking about the Jordan algebra of self-adjoint operators, but you do know what are the skew adjoint operators. Well, I know. <laughs> Yes. Um, I mean, like over any of these base rings, are they somehow, oh. like, you, you know, I know what a skew adjoint real matrix is. I right. know it, I probably even, so. Yes, do, okay, yeah, sure. You have, have those, Lie algebras lying around. Yeah, there are those Lie algebras lying around and those are, and, and so if you are willing to work in a framework where the symmetry generators are those skew adjoint guys and the observables are the self adjoint guys and you work with both of them, then you're fine. Yeah, so that's fine. Okay. Um, so, so basically, you would just have to accept to do those kind of quantum mechanics. You would have to ex accept the idea that that symmetry generators and observables are are different, fundamentally different kinds of things. Whereas in the complex case, you can turn one to the other automatically by multiplying or dividing by i. And so, you know, yeah. So I mean, I. You know, I can't boss God around. So, if, I mean, if God had wanted to use uh, real quantum mechanics, then then she would have uh, just accepted that that observables and and uh, symmetry generators are going to be different. But but anyway, I'm trying to make an argument that there's something specially nice about the complex case. And and physicists, for example, will say like, if you want to know how time evolution works, you write down the Hamiltonian, right? So that, that's saying that like, you tell me the observable, I'll tell you the symmetry it generates. So that would not work in, <clears throat> in these other worlds of uh, described by the other division algebras. And, so, and in the Octonian case, do you have enough associativity to get the Lie algebra to work or? or? There, <laughs> sorry, I'll have to think about that. There, there is a Lie algebra, there is a Lie algebra of derivations of your Jordan algebra in every case. And so you can use, you can use that Lie algebra as your as your symmetry generators. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I'll probably yeah, for the exceptional Jordan algebra case that the algebra would be the Lie algebra of the group F four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, looks like you have a question, Lee, or a comment. Yes, um, we were you were talking about the sphere S two and the action of S L two C on it. And the, you, if I understand you right, there's an analogous sphere made from Octonians. But is there an action of SL2 Octonian on it? Yes, there is. If you know, if you can figure out what the heck SL2 Octonians is, um, but but um, so you can't take SL2 Octonians too literally because two by two matrices of Octonians don't form a group. The multiplication is not right. associative. But there's a group that everyone who's thought about it has agreed should be called SL2 octonians. And it turns out that it is the group, um, sorry, it is, it is the group spin 91. So it's the, the double cover of SO91. Okay, and that's on, it's basically the eighth sphere. Yeah, that's right. So if you're in 10 dimensional Minkowski space time, Lorentz transformations form this group that you're, or the double cover forms this group you're calling SL2O and it acts as conformal transformations of your field of view, which would be an eight sphere. Very uh, good. And so it's has all anybody, very much like that. Anybody ever written down a conformal field theory that had those symmetries? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, there would be people here in the audience who'd be much more likely to, to know, I think. So I don't know. Thank you. Uh-huh, sure. It sounds like something some string theorist should have tried, right? Because this is the uh, no, this no, is no. the uh, space time uh, that string theory lives in very not very nicely. Okay, so I'll, I'll march on. Um, so what about H two O and H three O? So these I haven't gotten into in great detail, although we were just starting to talk about them. So amazingly, these Jordan algebras are actually connected mathematically, at least, to the standard model. Uh, so there are three papers here by uh, Michelle and Yvonne that discuss this issue. And I just want to uh, summarize them and maybe try to, try to isolate some of the nice mathematical ideas in these papers. 
So remember from my last talk, if you can, uh, that choosing a unit imaginary octonian, which I'll call I, gives a way of including the complex numbers into the octonians. And thus, because the octonians have an inner product on them, it lets you split the octonians into a direct sum of vector spaces, one of which you can identify with complex numbers, and the other I'll just call C perp, which will be a six dimensional space. Also, it puts a complex structure on C perp coming from left multiplication by I. So left multiplication by I makes the octonians into a complex vector space uh, and it splits into a copy of C and then a, this th th six dimensional real space which becomes now a three dimensional complex space. So that same kind of trick works for the self-adjoint matrices. Uh, so if we take the two by two self-adjoint matrices of the complex numbers, it now gets included into the two by two octonionic self-adjoint matrices, just because we're thinking of complex numbers as special octonians. Uh, and then we get, because there's an inner product on, on, on H2O coming from this trace that it has, uh, it lets us split H2O into H2C and a copy of, of C perp. And so this, I've shown how to identify with 10 dimensional Minkowski space time, this one with four dimensional Minkowski space time, and this is six dimensional in the real sense, a six dimensional real uh, vector space, or if you like a three dimensional complex vector space. So we get all this from choosing a unit imaginary octonian. Now, part of the funny business that's going on is that H2O has naturally the structure of both the 10 dimensional Minkowski space time, which comes from this, the fact that the tr determinant is the Minkowski metric, but it also has a 10 dimensional Euclidean space. It has a Euclidean inner product, which you get using the Jordan product and then taking the trace. So if you work out what this is, you get the same kind of expression. Uh, John, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Sorry to interrupt you. Could we just go back to the previous slide, if you don't mind? The last yep. equation. Yep. Now, does this have an interpretation in terms of SL2O being writable as, say, SL2C and SL2H? Uh, not SL2. I don't know how to do that. I mean, this definitely says that SL2C is a subgroup of, of SL2O, and then the uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know how to write SL2O in terms of SL2C and SL2H. Yeah, that doesn't. It's okay. We, we can we can no. talk later. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. So so I was saying that when you have a Jordan algebra, it naturally gets just from its Jordan multiplication, it naturally gets a determinant and a trace. And so if we use both of those. H2O naturally gets the structure of both a Minkowskian metric and a Euclidean metric, both invariant under all transformations that preserves the uh, multiplication. So the Jordan, so the automorphism group of the Jordan algebra, the things that preserve the Jordan product has to also preserve both of these uh, kinds of metrics. And so it must be contained both in 091 and also in 010. So it must be contained in 09. And in fact, it turns out that it's, it's exactly equal to 09. So this sort of shed some light. So this sort of shed some light on the uh, Euclidean or Minkowskian puzzle that I was posing last time about, do, should we think of H, should we think of uh, the standard model gauge group as sitting inside uh, SO10 or SO91? And the answer was that it's in both. Uh, but this, this is sort of meant to give some uh, new look on that. Um, it's much easier to see actually that the automorphism group of H2O hat is just exactly 09 because you just use the fact that it's isomorphic to the spin factor uh, and the spin factor, the multiplication on it only depends on 
The only interesting part about it is the dot product on R9. So anything in O9 will be an automorphism of this Jordan algebra. Now, we can already see one kind of way then to get the standard model gauge group into the game here. So if we go and work not with O9, but with the double cover of its connected component. So you may wonder why I'm doing this and I'll get back to it, but that, that will be spin nine. So let's switch from working with O9 to spin nine uh, for reasons that aren't terribly well motivated yet, but certainly common in physics to, to do that. Uh, so the sub of spin nine that preserves so spin nine will act on H2O uh, and the subgroup that preserves the uh, H2C will be, one, one can check, just um, spin th three times spin six, or actually that's sort of double counting the double covers. So it's really that mod Z mod two. So basically what's going on here is that the subgroup of spin nine that preserves uh, H2 of C will will act on nine dimensional space, but it will act on it in a way that preserves a split of nine dimensional space into three dimensions, which are the ones coming from, from this four dimensional space time and the six remaining spatial dimensions. So that's why, it, 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 that, that's intuitively why we get spin three times spin six showing up. But there's some nice Lie group uh, coincidences that say that you can also think of that as SU2 times SU4. Um, and as we saw last time, this group here contains a copy of the gauge group of the standard model. Let me just remind you a bit how that goes. So we can sort of take the Padi Salam model and strip off one of the SU2 Padi Salam model and actually map U1 times SU2 times SU3 into SU2 times SU4. Uh, in, in the following fashion, which I discussed in more detail last time, and it's not quite one-to-one, -one, but it's just three-to-one. Uh, and so then if you, if you, if you uh, take this group here and you mod out by Z mod two, which is, what we have to, which is what we have to do up here, then you get actually a six-to-one homomorphism from U1 times SU2 times SU3 into SU2 times SU4 mod Z mod over Z mod two, uh, and you can show that the kernel of this homomorphism is exactly that six element subgroup of this group that acts trivially on all these standard model fermions or all the standard model particles. So we get an inclusion of that quotient group into SU2 times SU2 mod Z mod two. And this quotient here is exactly the True, what I'm calling the true gauge group of the standard model. So that's how this group uh, contains the standard model gauge group. I mean, that's a way that it contains the standard model gauge group. That's the most physically relevant way. Um, so, so what we draw from this is that the standard model gauge group acts as automorphisms of the Jordan algebra H2O that preserve the subalgebra H2C. And if you want to sell this in the popular press, you should say it like this. The, the true gauge group of the standard model acts as symmetries of an octonionic qubit, and it preserves the subalgebras, subalgebra of observables of a complex qubit. I mean, that's that's perfectly true. It's not, it sounds flashy, but it's perfectly true if what we mean by octonionic qubit is the algebra of observables, which is this Jordan algebra, H, H3, H2O, and similarly here, H2O. So this sounds nice. I don't know what it means, but it sounds nice. Uh, but, but if you think about it a little bit more, although it sounds impressive, it, it leaves open two really big questions. We, there's some slack in this description. First of all, the automorphism group of H2O is actually O9. And for some unmotivated reason, I switched to working with spin nine, the double cover of its connected component. So why should we be doing, why should we be using spin nine? Second of all, 
although this sentence is, is true, um, in fact, the standard model gauge group is not all of the automorphisms of H2O that preserve H2C. There's this larger group that, that does that. So then the question is what, what makes the smaller group, the standard model gauge group special? So we haven't really characterized the standard model gauge group by means of these sentences here. So we can tackle these questions and answer these questions. Um, and the interesting thing is that to answer them, we need to bring in the exceptional Jordan algebra H3O. I mean, I don't know if we need to, I shouldn't be so bold, but, but we're, that's how I'm going to, that's what I'll do. So as I mentioned, that, that's the Jordan algebra of observables of an octonionic Q-trit or more concretely, it's just these three by three matrices, the diagonal elements are real. Um, this has a larger automorphism group. It's a 52 dimensional group, it's called F4. We won't need to know too much about it. Well, we actually, I guess we will, but, but we, we, we will to prove all the things I'm going to say, but we won't, I won't prove them. So one interesting thing about it is that F4 can't act on O3 so although you might think of F4 as the symmetries of an octonionic Q-trit, and you might have thought that an octonionic Q-trit should have something to do with O3, it, that's not a representation of F4 in any non-trivial way because the smallest representation of F4 is, is bigger than the dimension of O3. This is 24 dimensional. Uh, this smallest rep is non-trivial rep is 26 dimensional. So there's no Hilbert space picture of the octonionic Q-trit, at least not a complete picture. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pick a copy of H2O sitting inside H3O as a Jordan subalgebra. You could do this in any way, but just for explicitness, I'll, I'll pick it as the, this two by two matrices uh, sitting inside the three by three matrices. So there will be a subgroup of the automorphisms of H3O that preserve that uh, copy of H2O. And that turns out to be spin nine. So this answers question A, which is why are we working with spin nine instead of O nine? So the proposed answer here is don't work with automorphisms of H2O because that's the group O nine. Instead, work with automorphisms of H3O that happen to map H2O to itself. So they will give automorphisms of H2O, but they'll also be messing around on doing things with H3O. And it turns out that these form the group spin nine. Okay, so the idea is we're led to this idea of thinking about H2O and H3O together with H2O sitting inside H3O. And we're, I'm just gonna pick a specific way of having it sit inside there. So just a quick question. So yep. is it correct to say that you can have H2O inside H3O in three different ways? Oh, well, you can have it inside in infinitely many different ways. They're, not all the ways are so beautifully described as like block matrices. Yeah, there are three, there are three very nice ways in terms of matrices, uh -huh. but, but there's actually a continuum of ways because there are these, you know, you, know, you, can, you can act by automorphisms and rotate, so to speak, into all sorts of different ways, yeah. I should not start thinking of three fermion generations in H3O and each two by two being one generation. Uh, you're, welcome. you're welcome to try and lots of people have, and I've never, none of them has ever reported back any success with that idea. So I, I don't, I don't know. I don't recommend it too much, but it, it would be really cool if something like that worked, but I, I haven't, I can't get it to work yet. Um, so why do we get spin nine when we, when we do this trick? Well, one way to see it is that you can think of H3O as split up into this way. So here's our H2O, and this is a pair of octonians here. So we got a copy of O squared, and then here's a lonely real number here, alpha. So as representations of spin nine, H3O actually breaks up into, this, uh, into these three representations. And so the way it works is that spin nine is acting on R trivially. So you should think of this as a scalar. It acts on O2 via the real spinner representation. So you should think of O2 as a spinner for spin nine and it acts on H2O as, as we already mentioned. You can, you can 
think of H2O either as nine plus one dimensional space time or 10 dimensional space and the rotations or the double cover of the rotations are acting on that. And then the Jordan product on H2O, by the way, can be described using invariant operations on these scalars, spinners, and vectors. And you can check then that only spin nine preserves all the, those operations. And so spin nine is the subgroup of automorphisms of H3O that preserve uh, H2O. So that's the idea. But the nice thing about it is we're seeing this nice uh, scalar vector spinner thing going on here. Um, so, okay, so now we're ready to answer question B, which is what picks out the standard model gauge group as a subgroup of spin nine? So here's one way to get at it. So first choose a copy of H2O and H3O, which I've, I've done. The subgroup of F4 that preserves that is spin nine. Then next, pick a unit imaginary octonium. So it turns out that the subgroup of F4 that preserves all the structure that that puts on H3O, I'll maybe be more explicit about, explicit about that in a minute, is SU3 times SU3 modulo the diagonal Z mod three. And then finally, the subgroup of F4 that preserves all of this structure, that, that is both the copy of H2O and uh, all the structure that this imaginary octonian puts on H3O, is exactly the true gauge group of the standard model. It's a, it's a subgroup of this, of SU3 times SU3 over Z mod three. Uh, and it's also a subgroup of this spin nine that I've mentioned here. So this is something I'd like to quickly sketch an argument for. I'm getting low on time here. But first, let me just sort of say the bumper sticker version of this yet again which is that the true gauge group of the standard model consists of precisely the symmetries of an octonionic Q-trit that preserve all the structure arising from a choice of a unit imaginary octonian on the one hand, and two, restrict symmetries of an octonionic qubit on the other hand. So again, I don't know what this means, but you could imagine that if nature were trying to fundamentally be working with octonionic Q-trits and yet still get the benefit of working with uh, complex uh, qubits, that it might want to <laughs> use this type of mathematics. Um, let, me, let, let me show you a little bit more about uh, how those results are, are obtained. This is all review of work in, in uh, Todorov and Dubois Violet's paper, by the way. So, so if you pick a unit imaginary octonian, you get an inclusion of the complex numbers in the octonian. So you get an inclusion of H3C and H3O, and you again can split up H3O in this way in terms of H3C in an orthogonal space, which is just the space of guys whose inner product with guys in H3 of C is zero, but if you work out concretely what it is, it's just these uh, off diagonal matrices whose off diagonal entries are just living in C perp. And this space here gets a complex structure via left multiplication by I. So we not only get this splitting, but we also get that this uh, complementary space becomes a complex vector space in a natural way. And so then there's a theorem which says that for any choice of a unit imaginary octonian, the subgroup of F4, that is the automorphisms of H3O, that preserve this splitting and also preserve the complex structure on this orthogonal space is SU3 times SU3 mod Z mod three. And most of the work in showing this is in uh, Ichira Yokota's very nice paper on exceptional Lie groups. But just to give you like a little hint of what's going on, I will tell you how SU3 times SU3 mod Z3 acts on H3O. <sighs> I'm sort of probably running out of time here, but um, you can think of this complementary space as a space of three by three complex matrices and so 
you can think of H3O as split up into self-adjoint three by three matrices plus arbitrary th complex three by three matrices. So you can think of it, any element of H3O as a pair of a self-adjoint matrix and a complex and an arbitrary matrix. And then a guy in SU3 times SU3 acts on this pair in the following way, where the first copy of SU3 conjugates your self-adjoint matrix and then multiplies on the right, roughly speaking, on the other matrix. And the other element of SU3 acts only on the, on the second matrix. Um, and well, and so that's how it works. And, and the important thing, I guess, to realize is that the two copies of SU3 that are showing up in this game are acting in very different ways. They're, they're, they have very different meanings, these two SU3s. So when we go all the way down to look at these standard model gauge group as a subgroup of this, we'll see that the second SU3 becomes the strong force SU3. And it's acting separately on each one of these matrices, sorry, it's on each entry of this matrix, which is an octonian. And it acts as octonian automorphisms that preserve an imaginary octonian. Whereas the first acts to mix up the different matrix entries. And this winds up becoming the electroweak group that is a subgroup of it winds up be, being the electroweak group. And it's only that subgroup that preserves the splitting of the three by three matrix into a, a one by one and a two by two part. So that's supposed to make it roughly intuitive about how this SU3 gets broken down into a U1 times SU2. It's because uh, it, it does so when you demand that we're looking at uh, transformations that preserve this copy of H2O sitting inside H3O. I know I'm going through this a little bit too fast to absorb, but my notes are, will be available. Uh, and lots of links to papers on this stuff. So basically the, the upshot stated, which I stated before, but I'll state it a little more precisely now. So if you pick an unit imaginary octonian, you get a Jordan subalgebra, oh, H3 of C sitting inside H3 of O. But then if you also choose a Jordan subalgebra, H2 of O sitting inside H3 of O, then you are ready to get the standard model gauge group because the group of automorphisms of H3O that preserves the splitting that we get and also the complex structure that we get on the complementary space and also this Jordan subalgebra H2 of O is isomorphic to the true gauge group of the standard model. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's the most precise uh, statement I'm going to give you of this of this result. Uh, if, that's, if that's too precise, you can read the summary here. So now I'm in the home stretch. So the, the summary version is what I've said before. I'll just say it again, that the true gauge group of the standard model consists of the automorphisms of the exceptional Jordan algebra that preserve all the structure coming from a unit imaginary octonian, meaning both the splitting and the complex structure on the orthogonal space, the complementary space and also preserve a copy of H2O and H3O. So what that means is that these symmetries are acting simultaneously as symmetries of a number of things. They start out acting as symmetries of an octonionic Q-trit, but they're preserving this copy of H2O and H3O. So they're also acting as symmetries of an octonionic qubit, but then we also are uh, picking out this copy of of the, the complex uh, Q, Q trit in the octonionic Q trit, thanks to this item one here. So it's also acting on H3C and it's also acting on H2C, which is the intersection of, of, of these, these two guys here. Um, so, so that's intriguing. Maybe this is all just a coincidence. Of course, it'd be nice if this actually led, led to something. Um, I'll just conclude by saying that this, oh yeah, sure, Lee. No, so conclude and then I'll, I have a question. Okay, so there are a bunch of problems. 
So here what I've been doing is I've been describing the standard model gauge group, but you would also want to know what about its representation on fermions. Um, that's one. And, and you might hope that since this, we've got this octonionic Q-trit idea running around in our description of the standard model gauge group, that maybe that octonionic Q-trit should be, should be there in the standard model. But it's not clear how that, how that is working. It's not even completely clear what we mean by an octonionic Q-trit in the following sense. We have this nice Jordan algebra, H3 of O. That's the observables of the octonionic Q-trit. There's no doubt about that. It does act as operators on O cubed uh, just by matrix multiplication in, in some funny way, uh, not associatively. Uh, but the symmetry group of H3O doesn't act on O3. It only acts on H3O and, it, and also on OP2, which are the pure states. So there's something funny about this O cubed way of thinking about, about things. Um, if the octonionic qubit would be less mysterious, the standard model gauge group um, sitting inside spin nine, it also acts on H2O. So it's also acting on the octonionic qubit. And there it's, you can show that it's actually a, does act in a nice way on O squared via the spinner representation of spin nine. And it makes sense to call that an octonionic qubit, an element of O2 is like a Hilbert space description of, of the octonionic qubit. Um, and it turns out that you, thanks to Kirill's work, there's a very beautiful description of the standard model gauge group as being exactly the subgroup of spin nine whose action on O squared commutes with right multiplication by a chosen uh, unit imaginary octonium. So that's all very nice. But then if you work out how it's acting on O2 with this complex structure, it's acting just as it does on the left-handed fermions in one generation. The right-handed fermions are, are not there. Um, so there's a big mystery left as to whether the stuff I've discussed can be fleshed out to give some description of the uh, fermions in the standard model in terms of octonionic mathematics, or in terms of this kind of octonionic mathematics anyway. There's other kinds of octonionic mathematics you can use, of course. Uh, so I'll end there. Okay, let's thank John. And uh, Lee, you had a question. Yes, John, this is a big question, but I'm sure you've thought about it. Um, at this point, what I would want to do if I was playing this game to see if this amounted to anything is invent some geometry, not representation theory. So is there any sense of how you could take this, represent, this version of the labeling of the group and construct a flat connection or any kind of connection acting on some three plus one dimensional manifold? And can we start to give dynamics to these objects rather than just investigating the representation theoretic structure? Um, I haven't thought about that a lot. So, so I don't have anything, I don't have anything great to say about that, except that we do, we do have this, um, copy of Minkowski space-time staring us in the face in this picture, which is, sure. which is H2C. And we do have the standard model gauge group running around. So it should be pretty easy to build a, a trivial bundle <laughs> with that gauge group over that uh, Minkowski space-time. But I haven't tried to, for example, like write down a Lagrange, like the, a, like say maybe like a start out like a gauge field, uh, Yang Mills Lagrangian, or even so, a topological field theory. Just write down df equals zero. And see if anything. Yeah, no, I, I haven't, I haven't, haven't tried any of those things. Um, I spent the last couple of weeks while I was preparing this talk trying to get the math of that I just described all cleared up in my mind. So that's that's all I've, that's all I, <laughs> that's all I've got. 
John, it's a great thing. It's a wonderful talk. <laughs> Thanks. I, very few of us could have done that. Thanks. Well, yeah, I should say that this um, is, it's, it's there in uh, Dubois, Violette, and Todorov's paper, and also in, in Kirill's paper. Uh, but being a mathematician, I've been try, trying to squeeze it down to some kind of theorem <laughs> uh, and trying to maybe hint, which might hint at some kind of conceptual meaning of what's, of what's going on or gives people some inspiration for, for, for what to do with this. And so, okay. yeah, that's what I meant to do. Could I uh, make a comment and a question? I couldn't find the appropriate uh, thing to button to push on here. Sure. Oh, is, am I? Am I? You're okay. Go ahead. Am I heard? Yes. Yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Oh, good, good. Um, yeah. Very nice uh, talk, uh, John. I, I just wanted to um, comment just about it's, it's to do with the choice of, uh, you know, unit imaginary, why should one pick out a unit imaginary octonion? Now, uh, earlier on in your talk, when you were, you were mentioning this, the distinction between um, multiplying by I to get, you can, if, if you're in the, com over the complex numbers, then if you have a uh, Hermitian matrix, you multiply it by I and you get an anti-Hermitian one, which you can use as a symmetry generator. Uh -huh. um, now, the thing is that you were saying, well, that picks out the that picks out the Jordan algebras over the complex numbers as special. Um, but, but there were two points here: is that over the you can do something like that for the other Jordan algebras, but then you're going to need instead of having a single generate single uh, observable which generates a symmetry, you need a pair of them. And so then you get the, you then the the operation is the associator rather than the commutator. So. If you and another, well, let me put it another way. If you if you look, and this is the, the, perhaps the main point I want I was wanted to say was that if you look at the Heisenberg uh, equation of motion, then uh -huh. normally you have to introduce an I. So that that's often the way that one explains why why do you need to have to ha why does complex why do you need to introduce the complex numbers in quantum mechanics? Well, because if you want if you want to generate uh, if you want a Hamiltonian to generate a motion in time. Uh -huh. You're going to have to introduce a factor of i. So right. um, I just wondered, but and there's another way of doing that. So essentially, you're picking out a direction of time because you could have i or minus i. Right. Um, I mean, there's if there's another way of doing that. So if you if you have that Heisenberg equation of motion, you can actually rewrite it uh, as if if your Hamiltonian can be written as the commutator of two other uh, emission matrices. That in fact you can rewrite that um, Heisenberg equation of motion in terms of an associator with your your two your other two uh, observables, and then of course that doesn't pick out any direction of time. So that will actually work for all the other cases as well, but it won't. Is that pick an out associator for the Jordan product? Yeah. So in other words, if you're looking if you if you're interested in the question, of how do I generate a time? How do I, you've got your observables yeah. and your, your states, but how, do, what about the time evolution? Okay. So, okay, in the complex case, that's easy. Heisenberg equation of motion. Uh -huh. yeah, There's yeah. an analogous equation of motion that applies in the other cases, but it doesn't pick out a direction of time. It doesn't pick out a direction. So uh -huh. I'm just wondering if in the case when we start applying this to the, to the standard model, if the motivation for picking out a unit imaginary octonian has to do somehow with, with essentially cosmology, I mean, you know, uh, picking out a direction of time. Huh. I, I, well, anyway, those are yeah. two slightly yeah. disconnected connected points, but maybe they are related in some way. Yeah, thanks. I think I actually have studied how you uh, get those derivations of Jordan algebras from associators, but I somehow hadn't connected it back to my the physics side of my brain. Uh, and so it will be good for me to think about that here. And yeah, um, and I, can, I, I can mention there's a I, there's a review of, of uh, Jordan algebras years ago. I I wrote and I put up more recently a few years ago. I put up a transcript of it on on the archive, and Great. I thought there was there was one point in it that I thought was was original, which was to do with something with what I was just telling you, 
But actually, then later, I actually discovered it's in the paper. It's in a paper of Nambu many years ago. It's ah. when he introduces Nambu mechanics, and he starts looking for. At some point, he starts to consider Jordan algebra as an associate, and, and in fact, it's this the same thing is actually in his paper. Ah, that's interesting. Well, then maybe I'll finally understand Nambu so, mechanics. Um, you, know, you can. You, so, so I mean, it, it's stated in the in this review thing that I wrote. It's on the archive, Great. but actually, the the original. Uh, you know, I didn't I didn't know that, but in fact, I found it later. It's in it's in uh, Nambu's paper. Oh, that's neat. Thanks. I'll look at that. Um, maybe Cheryl or Lee. Love to John. I had two questions. Uh, uh, one is that few slides back, you had a SU three cross SU three. One right. of the SU threes you identified with the strong interaction. Can the other one be SU three flavor? This is one. Okay, so first you can answer this, then I come to my next question. Yeah, well, everyone is tempted to relate the. Oh, sorry. Did every did you say flavor, um, or your generation? No, I, I mean. Yeah. Uh, Generations, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, yes. everyone is tempted when they see the exceptional Jordan algebra to think it has something to do with the three generations. Um, I, I haven't managed to find a, a way to make that very, to make that really work. In this particular case, these, the, the other SU, th both of these SU3s, uh, I mean, the standard model gauge group is sitting inside this SU3 times SU3. And one of them is giving you the strong force SU3. And the other SU3 you should think of as maybe like some kind of primordial SU3 that contains the U1 times SU2. So you can imagine some uh, so, uh, the, breaking okay. scenario where, where the electroweak force was once upon a time its own SU3. Uh, but, but it has nothing visible to do with like uh, the three generations and all. So, uh, so the related question is, uh... What if you go to a complexified H3O where the group is E6? Uh, okay, what's the difficulty if you try to represent three fermion generations using that? I don't know what the difficulty is with that. Sorry, I, I can't, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, okay. I haven't tried it hard enough to, to find an obstacle. But I, uh, I, could there, one there try? There are other interesting things to say about complexifying this uh, H3O and, and bringing E6 into the picture. Mm -hmm. Latham was ra raising that issue uh, in some emails recently because it might, it might deal with what I consider the very pressing problem that, uh, that right now, if we try to use this octonionic description to understand the Fermions. It's yeah. it's rather easy to get the left-handed fermions into the game, but but the right-handed fermions aren't 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 so easily showing up in this description. Yeah, just okay. quickly to say, I, I I discussed that a little bit. That's discussed a little bit in a paper that I posted last this past summer, and I'll I'll talk about that a little bit more in my in my well a lot more in, in my talk later in the workshop. Uh, Great. It's uh, okay. the answer's yeah. a little bit involved. Great. Yeah, I'd like okay, to thank you. think more about that. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Uh, ben. Hi there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Ben. I'm in Canada, uh, Saskatchewan. Thanks very much for your talk. Yeah. What I wanted to uh, yeah. what I wanted to ask about was so much. You're supposed to look at this idea of selecting an imaginary unit in the octonians in the context of a Jordan algebra, um, because you can say that in one sentence, and because we're familiar with constructing Jordan algebras uh, as matrices over octonians, for instance, but the group F4 it has a lot of symmetry. And if we can select any three orthogonal, um, I think you call them pure states, then we can split uh, this 27 dimensional algebra into one plus one plus one plus eight plus eight plus eight. And we have to go further to specify octonion structure. And only then can we say, let's select an imaginary unit and what's interesting to me is that after uh -huh. selecting that imaginary unit, um, we're going to relax that previous constraints that we put on there because the standard model is not inside of G2 and it's not inside of D4. So I, 
I, I wonder if, uh, if looking at Jordan algebras more directly and seeing the octonians as, as downstream of the exceptional Jordan algebra might give us a new way to sort of state your two sentence answer to where does the standard model come from? Yeah, that sounds nice to me because that sounds like a like a math problem. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like a, a problem that that uh, should have some solution. Um, I haven't thought about that enough, so maybe we could talk about that sometime. So, so yeah. So the, the way I would like to try to go about that would be to start out just thinking of H3 of O as a Jordan algebra. And you're, and you're right, not, not acting like you don't know it's three by three matrices of, of octonians, just think of it as sort of an anonymous Jordan algebra, and then figure out what's extra structure you have to slap on that Jordan algebra to break the symmetry group down to the standard model gauge group, but phrased purely in the Jordan algebra language, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how to do that, uh, but that sounds like a fairly well-posed math problem. I mean, it could have lots of answers, but it should have a good answer. Do you have an idea? I have an idea. Um, I think that the first step would be to say, um, we've got a Jordan algebra, and so we've got a manifold of primitive inipotence, which are your pure states that you mentioned. Yep. That's the octonian projective plane. Um, so if you select any point in the octonian projective plane, that's the same thing as selecting an H2O subalgebra, because that's yep. just the vectors that are orthogonal to it relative right. to this trace. Uh, and then the next step, which is the tricky one, which I have played with, but I'm not sure how it works, is realizing that um, H2O, it has got the eight sphere, like you said, um, but these primitive impotence, they actually have a um, Riemann manifold structure. So they have geodesic curves. Mm -hmm. And I think, I speculate that if you just select any geodesic curve on this eight sphere, that might be enough to get you quite close to the standard model. So it would be select a primitive impotent and then select a geodesic curve on the eight sphere. I think that might be enough or it'll be, it'll get you close, I think. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, I that's nice. Yeah, I definitely completely agree with pick picking the primitive in inimpotent or pure state. At one point in my talk, I was get describing things when I was trying to write this talk, I was describing things that way instead of picking out a copy of H2O. But those are, but those are completely equivalent. Uh, so yeah, so then you could, so then it seems to me you need to get down to getting yourself a copy of H2C in there, but then, well, at least in the description that I'm talking about uh, in, my, in my talk, we need, we need more than just, uh, we need a bit more than that. There's some extra, a little bit of extra structure that's being pre preserved by the standard model gauge group. Anyway, thanks, that's, that's a good thing to think about. Uh, I think Namrata has had her hand up for a while. Hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, it was a wonderful talk um, and I was able to follow through. So thank you so much. Um, so my question actually kind of um, ties in with the previous question from the person from Saskatchewan um, is that uh, it, it's similar. Like when you were talking about, um, you know, the cones where you have the determinant equals zero um, and then you have the states and you had the pure states in blue, which you would, which you would like call, let's say a uh, boundary uh, yeah, states. The, like, the right word for that would be extreme points. So those, uh, there, there's certain, I mean, in this case, it's the whole boundary, but in, in general for the Jordan algebra, the pure states are what you call the extreme points of the, of the states. Anyway, we could get into that if we cared, but go ahead, yeah. Right, so so basically, I, I, I guess my first thing would be, we would have to describe such extreme points. Um, but I guess the question is like, can we use these um, Jordan algebras to describe the Minkowski space with these pure states on the boundary? And um, basically where I'm going is 
to have this like to be able to describe this manifold um between two different um uh, between two different uh, let's say not boundaries per se but whatever uh, field you're looking at two different gauge fields um by i mean we can always use a path integral or some other way to connect them to actually describe um, the relationship between like the boundary and let's say the bulk, for example. So can can we use Jordan algebras to do that? Like how close is it to Minkowski space that we can actually use that? Um, I don't really know a good answer to that, but I mean, I will just say that, I mean, every, everything about Minkowski space time is is available in this uh, Jordan algebra framework for spin factors. Like the problem, in a sense, is that even more than what you want is available because for what what the spin factor is really describing is not exactly Minkowski space time, but it's actually Minkowski space space time with a chosen time axis. So, okay. so, um, so that's that's why these symmetries get of the spin factor get to be not the uh, Lorentz group, but a smaller group, which is like O, I guess in this case would be like O and. Um, so you have the sort of both the benefits of Minkowski space-time and Euc Euclidean space-time. Uh, but by the way, if you only, if you throw out some aspects of the Jordan algebra and only keep track of the determinant, then the symmetries that preserve that are just going to be the Lorentz group. And so you should, you should, you should do that. Uh, okay. So I'm not completely answering your question, but I guess I'm saying that, in fact, the Jordan algebra structure is sort of more structure than you need to describe Minkowski space time. Right. Um, uh, the only uh, one of the reasons I had asked that, like, I don't know if anyone's done this, but it makes sense. Like, just because, like, you, you just said that the spin uh, factors have a lot more um, information, so to speak, uh -huh. like uh, structural information, uh, than, let's say, just the Lorentz group. So it, it just, it, it would give you more of an idea of what said boundary would look like, or like, you know, the, what other structures may arise, especially if you're doing something in terms of um, quantum gravity, so to speak. I, I know I'm speaking in generalities uh -huh. because I yeah, haven't I done this either. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything terribly good. I don't have anything so, terribly good to say about that. I guess, um, could you describe what you meant by um, when you said the pure states would be like critical, special states, like critical ones? They're, no, they're called extreme points. Extreme so the idea points, okay. is that the, the, I'll point my hand at this picture, but you should somehow be imagining a general Jordan algebra. Uh, and so, or maybe I should not get, get rid of the picture here. So, so there's this cone of non-negative elements and then the ones whose trace is one they're called states and that, that set of states is what's called a convex set meaning that you can if you draw a straight line between any two states any point along that interval between them will again be a state so so convex linear combinations of states are states and whenever you have a convex uh set there's a concept of extreme point so an extreme point in a convex set is one that's not lying on one of these line segments between any other points in the convex set. So like if my, if my convex set was a ball, the points on the surface of the ball would be extreme points because if I, there's, if I take two points on the ball and draw a straight line between them, the points on, on that straight line in the middle of the straight line uh, couldn't be couldn't be on the surface of the ball. So, so the points on the surface of a ball are extreme points because they don't lie on any line joining any other two points. But, but extreme point is a more specialized concept than the boundary because for example, if I take a cube, a cube is a convex set, but the points on the faces of the cube in the middle of a square are not extreme points because a point on the face of a cube could be gotten by drawing a line between two other points on the face of the cube and picking a point in, along that line. So for a cube, only 
only the uh, edges of the cube and the corners are the extreme points. Um, okay. So it takes, it takes a, it, it's actually um, quite tricky to visualize this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's very easy to visualize the states in this kind of example when, when they're a ball and then the pure states, uh, the extreme points are a sphere, but it's, I, I've had a lot of trouble visualizing these, these other examples so that what we're saying here is like for the case like n equals three, so we're saying that CP2, which is a pretty interesting four-dimensional manifold, not at all a sphere, CP2 you can think of as the extreme points of a convex set of, of, the, of the, de the density matrices. So the states in this case are density matrices. So I'm saying you take density matrices, three by three self-adjoint matrices with trace one, look at the extreme points of that and you, and you get CP2. So, so that's an example of, of how these extreme points work. Right. Um, thank you. I think this makes even, this for some reason that makes even more sense now, because if you are looking, for, if you are looking at a um, Minkowski space time, a curved Minkowski space time, then it makes sense. You start with the, you know, um, n equals two, and then you can like go forward. And... Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm yeah. gonna look into sure. this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michelle. Yes. Uh, I uh, well, thank you for your lecture, which was very clear. I have no no real question. I have some remark on. Uh, some questions we have been uh, posed. So first, um, the origin of my work was, I was working from a lot of time to add a piece of quantum space to space time to make uh, the theory of, uh, of fundamental particle because I think it is a phenomena of quantum theory. And, uh, well, and a lot of things uh, are quite uh, quite well, but at some moment, uh, around ten years ago, I was wondering what is the meaning of the unimodularity, the unimodularity of SU3, a scholar group. It's, it is absolutely not natural because if we say that uh, the quark has uh, three uh, colors, or, okay. A Hilbert space has three dimensions, the group should uh -huh. be U3. Okay? Uh -huh. so do, doing that, I say, okay, this means that there is a complex volume down, so a trilinear form. Uh -huh. So since we are in three, dimension, in three dimension, one always can do transform this in a product, like the vector product uh, in air. So you, you take your volume and you say volume of x, uh, y, z is the scalar product of the, pro the new product of x and y with z. And like that, you obtain an anti-symmetric, anti-linear product on C3. Okay? Right, yes. And now SU3 is exactly the group which preserves these two things. Yes. Uh -huh. So now, uh, if you have the curiosity to compute the norm of the product, the norm square of the product, this new product, you find that it is the product of the norm square, okay, of the two factor minus the norm square of the scalar product of these two factors. So you see, this say you that if I had a factor C, and if I say that I have a projection of C on C on C of C3 on C plus C3. Okay. I can say that if I take a projection of this product, the scalar product on the on the factor C and the product before, then this this product would be, would be isometric. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now the natural thing to do when you are in this situation is to add a unit which correspond to the factor C that you have here. And to say, okay, I have a product on C3 plus C, okay, which is such that if I take the factor, two, two elements of the C3 and if I take the other product, 
the projection on the three is the, the product I have already, and the projection onto the unit is the scalar product. So once you see that, you say you you should you should try to extend this product as an isometric product from C3 plus C on itself. Okay, which is a and there are not so much, this depend of some phase, but uh, it's essentially unique and it's lead to a product, which is C3 is exactly the group which act linearly on C3 and which preserves this product. This uh -huh. product, of course, is not bilinear complex. And since for two reasons, first, uh, the, pro the internal product uh, is, uh, as I say, antilinear in the two factor, and second, is this sesquilinear on the projection on, uh, on the product. But what you see when you do that is that uh, looking a little, this, you obtain like that a division algebra. Yes. Since this product is not uh -huh. sesquilinear, okay, it's a product on R8. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Which is the division algebra. So you have not, and which is isometric. Okay. We have not the choice. It's necessarily the octonion. But of course, it is the octonion realized by an, a linear action, a linear complex action on the factor C3. This is why this select inside the octonion, this, uh, this, uh, this C3, and this action. And you don't, you must not forget this action because this action is really the color group, which act linearly, okay, on the on the component of the quark. So now, uh, Wait, of course, yeah. when you see that, of Which course. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, but uh, it's been, we've had a very long discussion already. So can you uh, try to make your question precise? Okay, I have no question. I have just <laughs> the remark. I say that first, so this is my first remark that uh, it is uh, completely natural to do the thing like that and to, to interpret then the factor C as the lepton associated to the quark because it's, of course, a, a trivial representation of C. My second point is the following. Uh, the difficulty to work with uh, the exceptional algebra is that all Jordan modules on this exceptional algebra are a factor of this exceptional algebra. The only irreductible module is the exceptional algebra itself. So all what you can do is tensorize with some vector space with Dundas itself. And if you try to make uh, the particle there, you can, but you will have some more particles. So this is uh, the second point. The third point is that if you look at the two by two uh, octonionic matrix, you can look at, you are right, the automorphism group of this is onus since it's a factor, the spin factor nine, okay? But uh, if you look at the subgroup, which preserve this uh, splitting in C plus C3 acting linear, and which act linearly on C, you mm -hmm. find that uh, it is the, the The, the connected part of this is O3 cross, uh, cross U3, okay? okay? So as you remark, this is not uh, exactly the standard group because there is a factor Z2 there. But this factor Z2 is easy to understand with your analysis because it corresponds to the fact that when you see that inside the, the exceptional algebra, You have two inner over there, okay? And uh, you see, when you, part, you pass from space-time to uh, the spinner field, of course, uh, you take a covering of... Uh, huh? of uh, what I mean is that this means that the uh, torsion part of the fundamental group of the group is not some, some obstruction, you see? Okay, well, we can, yeah, not I can try to... Not at all to, to make a, a module over there which contain all the information of the particle of the standard model mm -hmm. for one generation. So this is all what I want to, to... I'll have to think about the last part, especially. So the first part, yeah, I, is something that I invented and then discovered that, that uh, it's in 
Yakota's uh, lectures on exceptional groups, which uh, is, well, I, I explained it in this blog article, I'm not gonna go over it, but the, yeah, so the idea is that, like you said, if you pick a complex inner product and a complex volume form on C3, then you can define a kind of cross product on C3, which is conjugate linear, which is why I'm writing this uh, overline here. But then if you, essentially, if you copy the usual formula for how to build the quaternions out of R plus R3, you get the, a formula for the octonions, yes, which is very beautiful. And then the, and then you see this way that the uh, subgroup of G2 that preserves a unit imaginary octonian has got to be SU3 because SU3 is exactly what's preserving the uh, the uh, inner product and the and the uh, uh, volume form on C3. So yes, it seems very. This people have thought about this in different ways for, for a while, but it's 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 very tempting to think that the strong force is connected to all of that nice mathematics. Okay, uh, we have 40 minutes past the end of the discussion. Uh, so I think we should wrap up. So let's thank John again. Great, thanks very much.